What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Man's Podcast. My name is Brian Brosey. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Keone Tita. And today we're joined by Kylie Stein, who joined us from the Flotation Tank Podcast, and she is back to discuss her work as a doula. Um, so, Kylie, how are you today? I am doing great. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, thank you for joining us again. Absolutely. We're super appreciative. So first off, what Keone mentioned in the Flotation Tank podcast, he was interested in your work as a doula. At the time, I really didn't even know what a doula was. So can you tell us what a doula is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a doula essentially is a birth companion or a birth support person. Um, so my role in terms of being a doula is to just be there for the birthing person in whatever way or capacity they might need. Okay. And that can range from emotional to physical to questions. Um, it's kind of a support that starts with all of my clients. I've been able to start from the beginning of their pregnancy. We work together throughout. I'm there for the delivery process. And then I also like to, um, a thing I like to do is postpartum visits. So I make sure to go in the home afterwards, um, just take like a healthy meal, help mom and baby in that way. So there's a wide spectrum in terms of the way doulas can look and the work that they do. Okay. And what type of places can they, I guess, practice? Can you be in a hospital room? Can you do all those things? Yeah. So you can be a doula in pretty much any environment. Um, in my experience, the the first four births I've been a part of have all been natural births, but they've been in different areas here in Jacksonville. One was in a birth center, Fruitful Vine. Um, one was at UF North mm. in their labor and delivery room. One was at UF North, what they call the nest, which was, um, it's a natural birthing center, but it's actually going to be closing at the end of July. So, it's unfortunate because we're losing that as a big asset here in the Jacksonville community. Um, but there are also doulas for home births um, as well as C-sections. So you can be a doula for any and every birth. Yeah, so you're prepared for everything there. Yeah. Kylie, yeah. How, what's the difference? Sorry, Brian. What, what's the difference between, if you can just briefly, an, an OBGYN, mm -hmm. a midwife, and a doula. Is there anybody else I'm missing there that could be that could help in the birthing process? Nope. Those are those are pretty much obviously nurses as well. But okay. um, so OBGYN is going to have more of a standard American medical model of education. A midwife has a different model in that. It focuses more on the physiological birth of the human rather than it being a medical intervention. Um, and then a doula is just someone who is there for support. So as a doula, I don't do anything medically. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not assisting with any checks or anything like that once we get into the birthing space. I'm there just for emotional, physical, mental support. So the doula is kind of the additional component and this, this world of being a doula has definitely hit a resurgence um, in the last 10 to 15 years. It's definitely something that's growing and I think that's just because of the state of our American medical model. Um, there's a lot of trauma in hospital birthing and since doulas have been implemented, we're starting to see that those numbers of trauma and intervention are dwindling when there's advocacy. Um, so that's something that's been really, really interesting for me to see. And the first couple birth experiences I had, I didn't, it wasn't something I really saw, but I actually was just at a birth recently and that was very much the case. Um, it was very, it was a very intervention-based birth. 
Um, and it was all at the hands of the medical system. And it was my first time seeing that. So it was very eye opening. And it was a reminder as to why I show up as a doula just to be an advocate for my clients. Um, and I didn't even realize that it was necessary, but it is just because at the end of the day, these hospitals are a business and they're making money and they make money off of birth and in that labor and delivery room or unit, how many people are in, how many people are circling out. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's definitely a process. And I think that the more people we have showing up to do this kind of birth work and just be there for support, it just shows that um, people who are birthing want to take that power kind of back into their hands just because it's something we are so capable of and we've been doing for years and years and years. Right. Uh, it's just the medical system has obviously created their little pocket of it. Yeah, they they make it like it's a like it's not a natural process. Almost like it's like like almost like a disease that you're given birth and it needs to be have an intervention. I get that, but when you say you're an advocate, so would you would you sit down with the 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 mother there and and go over like what do you, what do you want out of this birthing process and what can I support you with can I talk to your physician about something like let's say for example they they absolutely want you know don't want to do a C-section or or don't want you know any any drugs during the birthing process is that something you stand up for them for and say look this is what she wants this is yeah, so it, I haven't had, I have had to, I've had to with my one client who birthed at the local hospital. Um, this was back in February. She was adamant in her birth plan. So when I meet with all my clients, we create a birth plan and we come up together just so we're on the same page to know what experience it is they desire because everyone is different. Um, and I just want to be clear about where we are and just the space I'm holding, who's going to be in that room with them just to get all the details. So I do go over a birth plan with my clients and then we print that off or we copy it so that they have it in their bag so that when they arrive at their birthing space, if I'm not there, because typically with the doula, they will call me when they want me to show up for support. So sometimes they'll make their way to the hospital, get checked in, be settled, and then they'll call me like four or five hours later. So they'll go in with their birth plan to give to their provider so that it's clear and they know exactly where we're going. Um, But I did have a situation where one of my client's birth plans was explicit in that she didn't want Pitocin to speed up the birth process. And she was there not even two hours and they were suggesting Pitocin. They were already hinting that she wasn't progressing. Um, and if she wasn't progressing, they were going to have to give her Pitocin. So it was a very fear-based interaction. And when I got there, she just like looked at me and she's like, do I have to take Pitocin? They're telling me if I'm not progressing, I have to take it. And that's where I I realized it was my time to step in and I just had to educate her as my client. I'm like, no, this is your choice. Yeah. Hospital policy is not law. And that's what so many people, I think, especially in America, don't understand that it might be a hospital policy, but it's not a law because it's your body. Um, So I just had to make sure she knew that and was empowered in her choice so that she could relay that to the nurse. So the next time the nurse came in and she offered it, my client said to her, I would not like Pitocin, please do not bring it up again. And so it's, if I need to step in and be an advocate and speak up, I will, but I prefer to, um, I prefer the approach of empowering my client so that they feel as though they are the ones communicating what their desires are. Right. Yeah. You know, it's for me as a, as a man, I, I can't, I, 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 the way the, the way society is about the whole birthing process, I'd be horrified if I was pregnant and had to give birth. I mean, I'd be so scared because it may, it makes it sound like if you're going through that birthing process that, you know, 
you're going to die if you don't have yeah. medical intervention right. there. Yeah. Plus, you're going through, especially a first-time mother, it must be mm -hmm. really, really <laughs> exciting. It, it is. To have to go through that. Yeah, you know, it especially is. Especially with all the scary stories that you hear out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I did it. I I was in, I was still in my little fantasy world until this last birth I just experienced, um, just because it was totally different than anything else. Um, it was, you know, they talk about in, in the birth world, the cascade of interventions. And that's, that's typically how it works. It starts with one thing that they're suggesting, you know, and they might not even have, and that's a lot of it is they don't have evidence-based proof, whereas they're not. 100% sure they're just like oh maybe this maybe that mm -hmm. um and that's what's just so hard is birth is such a physiological natural process and everyone I think goes through it in an entirely different way so I think it's very hard for us to slap you know one fits all standard care this is how we treat <laughs> right. birthing people and that's exactly how our medical system wants to but I'm very hopeful because I think that with the advocacy of doulas um, and I do think we're at just a precipice of people reclaiming their power to birth in the way that they want. There's a lot more options out there. There's a lot more knowledge. And I think that's a huge thing. It's, it's something I'm constantly talking about to all of the women and the people in my life who are trying to conceive or who I know just because I feel like I, until I got into this world, I truly had no idea in the way our bodies work to bring babies to earth. Mm -hmm. um, we're just, our bodies are just so capable unless there's an issue. And, you know, I totally understand that with high risk pregnancies, you have to be in a medical space to make sure everyone is safe. Right. Um, but there's, there's, a need and now that I've witnessed so many people do it naturally and in a way that they choose I definitely think that that is a standard we should be shifting towards right and, it, and it, from what I understand talking to some midwives um, um, letting letting the, the family choose how to do it or having a home birth in in a lot of ways is especially if there's no complications is safer than being in a hospital. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And that's where, I mean, I, I, for me personally, it's something I struggle with consistently whenever the time comes, I don't know. And that's why it's so hard because I've seen so many experiences now. I don't know what I would choose, but I definitely don't think a hospital would be where I would choose to birth. Hmm. Right. Is it is it uh, legal or a legal in Florida to to do a home birth or do you know? It's not. Okay. It's not, and there's actually because the nest is closing, um, which the nest was essentially a couple birthing suites in UF North's little annex. So it was an amazing asset to the community because you could birth there naturally. They had an amazing like water tub. They have a nice big shower, um, all these naturally natural pain relief um, components for laboring, but it's closing because finances, um, but it's a bummer because a lot of women have used it. A lot of women have had amazing births. A lot, a lot, a lot of women have had um, vaginal births after cesareans in the nest. Um, and their statistics are just amazing. They were one of, one of the only centers, I believe, in the United States that is a natural birthing center in a hospital. And for the peace of mind, it's just everything you want because if something goes wrong, yeah, yeah, they're able high. to wheel you down and you're safe. So it's so heartbreaking just for the community of Jacksonville to know that that's going away. But I think we're going to see a, a surge in home birth because of it. Okay. Because there's, there's a couple, there's at least two or three midwives who since the nest is closing are expanding their home birth practices. Okay. So, and that's, it, that's really telling, right? I mean, having yeah. a, having a vaginal, well, having a vaginal birth 
after cesarean, I mean, most conventional doctors are like absolutely. They won't allow it. Yeah, they won't allow it, but but it can be done, and mm-hmm. and having a doula to advocate that for you, right? Barring no, you know, no other complications would be would be great. And like you said, I mean, women have been having natural vaginal births for what millions of years, so millennia. <laughs> Right. So we make it out to be something that it's, uh, it shouldn't be a scary process. That's right. I, right. I it's we, hard. And that's what I tell all my new clients. It's hard. It's very hard work. It's probably, it's the most intense work I've ever seen done on earth, but it's worth it. And just to know that it's creating life. And yeah. I truly think that when we, and I think we are now, but I think that when we shift the way we respect life and how it's brought to earth, that it'll start to shift everything. So I'm really hopeful since I got into this birth world. Um, I'm seeing a lot, but I'm very hopeful because I feel like things are definitely shifting. Yeah. How long have I you mean, been doing it? Oh, oh, go ahead. Since last October. So I'm not even at a year yet. And um, my next client will be due is due in November. So, yeah. And so are most of them contacting you around the time they find out they get pregnant, like you kind of mentioned, and coming up with a long Usually I meet with them about, like, when they're three to four months is usually when we get together, sometimes earlier. Um Last week, I had a client email me thinking she wanted a doula, but then she ended up not. So, and she was due that weekend. So, it just Uh, depends. (laughs) So, what what's the uh, how did you get educated? What what's the what what's the skill set you have to go through, and how would somebody become a doula? Absolutely. So, in the U.S., there is not um, there's not a regulating agency in terms of doulas. There's You'll find you'll find your bigger brands, um, Pro Doula, Dona, and I did my training through Dona. So it was a weekend training, and in that weekend, you go over a lot of it is comfort measures and um, just things you can do to work with a laboring woman. We also did in that class we learned um, about breastfeeding. And we did components um, where we watched a couple different videos and things like that. So it's a weekend training. And then afterwards, you have to be in attendance of three births that count as your kind of volunteer births, in a sense. Um, And then from there, it's just submitting some paperwork and um, like a final paper on your experiences. So, (laughs) but there's lots of awesome, like the postpartum trainings, there's lots of different trainings that you can do if you want to kind of focus on a specialty. So that's what's cool is there's postpartum doula trainings. Um, There's now with the climate we're in, I know women who are doing, who are abortion doula trainings. Um, Yeah, just because they're full access of healthcare for anyone who needs it. So that's something they're taking into their realm. Um, There's end of life doulas, people who are there to be support at the end of life. Um, And that's something that's definitely been interesting to me Um, just in the circle of watching birth, I think it makes so much sense if you are an emotional person who can handle, um, witnessing birth and death. I think that is just such a neat way to be in service. So it's really cool because I think, um, with, with the way our society is changing and just this support and more connection, um, we're seeing a growth in these fields because there's a desire for that. People, people want to be supported in a lot of ways. Kylie, how do you prepare? Oh, I, you're about to go in or (laughs) whatnot. Yeah. So I have a bag that's ready to go. Um, obviously now that I've done it a couple of times, I have my, 
I have my stuff set um, just so when I know, when I know I have a client on call, I get my bag ready. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. It's never, um, cut and clear and how long I'm going to be there. Obviously right. it's not something <laughs> that's on, I'm on a time for. Um, so it's just preparing myself beforehand and taking care of myself, making sure I'm moving, eating, doing everything that I need to stay nourished. And then the biggest part of that is doing that after because I notice it is such an emotional drain for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to float. I have to get a massage or body work or some kind of way to take care of myself just because it is a lot. It's a lot to hold that space um, and yeah. to just show up in that way, but it's also so rewarding. Yeah, so. absolutely. And then Kylie, what? go ahead, Kenny. Sorry, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm fascinated by this. Sorry, I keep interrupting you, Brian. <laughs> but, but anyway, so my, my question is, is uh, what about the men? I mean, I think you know, we're not very emotional, tend not to be very emotionally open. I mean, I know for me, if uh, my wife is pregnant, getting ready to give birth, I'd be terrified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I would so. need a doula myself. <laughs> yeah, I, think, for I think I would, yeah, I think I would need somebody to like maybe hold my hand through that process. Exactly. And that's, that's why, that's why doulas are so great. Um, because doulas can support this partner as well. And that's something that I think is huge. And it's a conversation that should be talked about. Um, there's a quote I read the other day on Facebook and it was so good. It was, I don't remember who it was from, but it was in the conversation was about, um, at a birth, yes, it's great to have your partner for support, mm-hmm. but it's like going to Mount Everest without a Sherpa. Yeah. And yeah. that's why you have a doula because the doula is there to support you and to support the partner, mm-hmm. um, in whatever way that is. And that's what, for me, it's looked, it's looked a lot of different ways for me. It's me showing the partner, Hey, you can do this. You can, can compress on the hips you can press on low back you can rub right here on her low back um and just showing like little comfort measures that feel good it's i mean i you know i've ran out and gotten smoothies at right. four like five thirty in the morning because no one has eaten whatever it is that i need to do to support so that that partner can be there for their partner um and it makes a huge difference um and that's what at first when I when I when I did my doula training, at first I was like, oh, my husband will be fine. And now I'm like, no way. I am gonna hire a doula. <laughs> Maybe hire him a doula. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just because it's it is, it's it's a lot. And to know that you have someone there to, to hold space for you, it's just I don't think um I just think in that, in that transformational moment, it's so valuable. Mm -hmm. How does somebody go, go about finding you? Yeah. Um, for me, I just, I, I don't, I'm not like super big on advertising myself right now. And I love it because the women and people I'm working with have all come to me very organically. So that's how I am doing it right now. But, um, Google obviously is going to be good for anyone, no matter what city they're in, just Googling doulas in their town. Mm-hmm. With that said, they're going to find doula agencies. They're going to find doulas who are independent. And that's, that's what I do. I'm not a part of an agency. I do it by myself, but I do have, um, two other friends who are also doulas and it's great because when I do accept a client, I'm able to have them as a backup. And that's why some people will go with a doula agency because with a doula agency, you have three to 12 to however many options. And then whatever doula is on call could show up or in some doula agencies, you can pick your doula. um, And then depending on if they're able to make it, they'll be there. So right now, I am just um, allowing it to grow organically for myself, but I know like in terms of growth, you can find doulas pretty much everywhere. Yeah. 
I'd say by now, and especially in the next 10 years. So it, it's, as, far, as far as uh, doulas go, are, is our midwives a good resource? Are OBGYNs a good resource for doulas? Yeah, midwives and OBGYNs together? are a good resource. I just think you have to know what kind of birth experience you want. I think that's what is really the biggest part is education. And that's something I'm realizing I, I need to do more of with my doula clients. So now with meeting my clients, we go through just like a basic, these are all the different ways you can birth. Right. Um, and just so they know that they have options. So I think that's the biggest thing for anyone who's trying to conceive or considering it um, is just really researching what kind of birth experience you want, because there are some people who don't want a natural birth experience and that is okay. Um, I just think you should know going into it, what you're getting into with Pitocin, with an epidural, with everything that comes in the medical model, just so you're aware. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. You'd have to be kind of educated on that more, more so, definitely more so than the person giving birth. Cause there's a lot going into it. You talk about Pitocin, you mm -hmm. talk about maybe using some of the uh, the uh, painkillers. Mm -hmm. What about? But what about the other stuff? Like as far as like letting the placenta sit and not, yeah. not clamping right away. Right? I actually um, I just did in the beginning of May. I did my training um, to process placenta, so mm -hmm. I am able to encapsulate if a client chooses, um, and I I fully support it. I'm 100% on board um, and that's something I go over with the parents too just asking them if, if they want to keep their placenta usually they're it's donated to the hospital and they do how do, how do you go about doing that because I, I would imagine I don't know but you, so you tell the OBGYN I, I just imagine like some like uh, stiff cardboard type white Caucasian doctor here <laughs> but you want to keep the, uh, the placenta are you crazy Oh yeah, yeah. People tell you crazy, and um, um, yeah. I mean, it's just it's not. It's something that isn't in in this American society. It's like, why would you want to keep your placenta? It's an organ. Um, yeah. They don't. People don't understand. But for me personally, I think I think there's value to it, um, especially with. There was something, there was an article I saw, I want to say a couple of days ago, released saying that they're coming out with a new drug for moms postpartum, and one of the main components in this drug comes from placenta. Ah. So, so that's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So medically, they're actually, there's something, they're thinking, oh, there's something to it. So yeah, I think they're, all those placentas they're keeping, obviously they're researching it and they know the value of what is in that. So what, what's the, what's the thought on this? It's, I'm, I'm guessing it's like it gives added nutrition or something like that. Yes. Yeah, so essentially, essentially the placenta um, with it being, you know, it's, it's the sac in which supported baby for its entire life. So in it is the blood of mom and blood of baby, but the blood never touches. Um, so all the stem cells, all of everything in terms of it's, you know, it's an organ that is literally grown just to sustain life. Yeah. Okay. So there's gotta... not, there's not a ton of research on the benefits of consuming your placenta. Um, and that's something I'm very honest and open with with all my mamas about like there's not we don't have that scientific research yet but we but, have some precedent don't we exactly I mean, in, yeah we do in the mammalian world. yeah exactly I, that's what and that's what it goes to you know tribally when it comes to animals it's it's just been natural to consume the placenta right so we see yeah, that in so, the animal world a lot that they consume the placenta. Okay. Oh yeah. I, I mean, and the thought is, I correct me, Kylie, but one of the things is that, like, I don't know, like an antelope who gives birth out on the plane will consume the placenta to, I don't know, keep to help keep predators away. But I always mm -hmm. was thinking, well, there has to be something more to that too. Like, maybe, you know, 
it, it's like almost like a nourishment type thing. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's all that nourishment. So I have a, I have a, a, a friend of mine who she, she, all her, all her births were at home. She's in the UK where I think in the UK, it's a little bit more prevalent, the, yeah. the home births and stuff like that. But yeah, she, <laughs> she, she kept her placenta and, stir fried it up or whatever and and consumed it and then yeah. and then was one gave it to, to like a doula or whoever to process and dry to take it in caps yeah every one of her pregnancies yeah it's fat it's fascinating all right yeah. i have another question for you so what what is your thought you don't have you don't have to answer this but i have i have strong <laughs> views <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so do you, what about the whole circumcision they're doing with, with that, that, I mean, at least all the male babies seem to get, I mean, what, what is the, what is your th thought on that? Cause to Mine, me, personally, yeah, yeah. I personally don't agree. Yeah. I don't either. I, I, think, I, I think it's, I mean, I don't want to sound harsh, but I do think it's a form of mutilation. Yeah. Um, just That's in where the, I go with it. In, yeah. In the sense of if it was done to a woman, you know, mm -hmm. how would we, what would we consider it in that way? Right. Um, so yeah, I, I personally, it's not something I would choose, but. But it's what? something you, it's as a doula, you can educate them on and say, yeah. Look, you, ha you have this option. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to, you don't have to do any. And that's, I mean, I have a girlfriend who, because of her experiences in the hospital, she was, they were trying to force her vitamin K shot and the eye drops for baby post birth. And she didn't want it. And because of that, they threatened to call um, whatever the local children's. Yeah, that's bad. Like in, in the hospital right after she had given birth, what they're fearing her into. It's just like, that's not okay. And that's, that's a, a big thing I, I feel is necessary for my clients who do want a natural birth in a hospital is just educating them that hospital policy is not law. It's just a policy. Well, educating them on why they're doing it and why you have a choice and what you have to be aware of if you choose not to do that. Yeah. Right. And to have someone in your corner as you're going through that stressful event who you've already discussed this with is their impartial party. It yes. seems 100% necessary because it, it, even at the dentist <laughs> and they're like, hey, right. we need to do this filling or this or that. And you're like, do I need it? Well, I mean, you need it. And it's like, well, do I really need it? Well, I guess not. And it's like, how do you make all these decisions? I'm not, I'm just sitting there with sunglasses on. I'm not giving birth. Right. right. <laughs> so I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Kyla, you mentioned some of these comfort measures that you do, and I'm just yeah. interested to hear a little bit more about these because as a student physical therapist, obviously I see a lot of people in a lot of pain. So what are um, some of like the comfort measures that you're utilizing? Um, so one thing obviously is floating. I let I, my clients float. I definitely encourage that. Um, but outside of that, when it comes to the laboring process, I don't think a lot of people understand how important movement is in a natural labor. Um, okay. and I've seen it now four times, um, with the client I was telling you about in February when I got there and they were telling her she needed Pitocin, she wasn't progressing. She was... Um, at that check, she was only three centimeters dilated, and that's what they were telling her is that she hadn't progressed enough. So from my knowledge and, like, what I know, I was like, okay, let's move. Let's just walk around the halls. Let's use the ball. Let's squat. Um, so we did that for, like, two and a half hours. And So what kind of things were they doing with, the like, a uh... – I forget what they're called now, but like the abdominal crunch ball basically is yep. what we're it's one of the big, big, I call it a birthing ball, but yeah, um, those big birthing balls. So just sitting and bouncing, okay, weighing in the hips and the pelvis. Um, you can bring your arms, um, like she had her arms on the hospital bed and was sitting on the ball and just kind of rolling just because it felt good when she was contracting. Yeah. Um, it's funny to yeah. me because as you're doing this and talking about these interventions, I can only imagine the hospital birth where you get shot up and it like the woman never moves. And you're stuck on a bed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. That's, that's what's so crazy to me. And the last one I witnessed was just like, 
she wasn't given much time to labor naturally. Um, they went immediately immediately to interventions and then by the next day she had an epidural so like once you have an epidural you can't move right um and it's hard it's hard for me to think that you know you can keep naturally progressing once you have that epidural um but you can also use um a piece of cloth around the belly and stand behind mom and kind of pull and that's called a rebozo so that's another technique that we use um i have a tens unit that's nice for kind of localized pain i bring that i use essential oils clary sage peppermint rosemary anything that mom is okay with and that's something i'll go over with her before um i also like to offer to bring like a speaker music just because it a lot of times if they want a natural birth, the environment is a big component for them in that. So I bring that into it as well. Um, And then affirmations. So if there's anything that they want me to be repeating or to say, um, one, I keep finding myself every birth, it's become my thing is like, you can do anything for one minute because that a contraction is typically one minute's time. Um, so just little reminders that keep them kind of focused. But mm-hmm. labor land is such a real thing. So it's so hard. Um, it's so hard because as you get into every birth, it's different. And what mom wants changes as she's laboring. Yeah, absolutely. So there'll be times where mom's like, I want you to press on my back. And then they're like, get off of me. I'm (laughs) over it. (laughs) It's just being open to riding with that flow. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine that just with the anxiety of it too, like there's decision making things going on all the way up until and after the birth that she may change her mind. Yeah. What he wants to do. Oh yeah. I've heard mom so many times right before. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. Yeah, I'm yeah, over yeah. it. You know, it's, it's because they are. They've been laboring for hours or days and pretty much running a marathon for their body and their mind. And they're just ready for the baby to be here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is there anything else that we should know or go over? Um, as far uh, as what what a doula can do for somebody nothing specific that i can think of it's just if um i just encourage anyone if they are trying to conceive if they are expecting and unsure to definitely reach out to someone for support um and and that's even to even if that's you know your best friend who you know that you would trust by your bedside during that time. Um, I think having the advocacy and just having the support makes a huge difference. Just to know that during that transformation, someone is there for you. Right. Yeah. I've got one more question for you, Kylie, about what you do after birth and what kind of services you recommend as well. Yeah. So after postpartum, I was a nanny for about five years. So I just love child care. Um, I love organization, things like that. So with all of my clients, when we meet, I offer a postpartum package um, and it's kind of customizable in that they get to choose what services they want. Um, I've made food, you know, it's been to a point where I've made like freezer meals for a week, gone over, dropped off the freezer meals, helped mom around the house, Um, And typically I'll do it like after the partner goes back to work when they really need the help. Um, And then some people it's, you know, just going to sit with baby so mom can shower for Mm -hmm. an hour and just (sighs) hang out and see him every like once every week. So with every client, it's a little bit different, but essentially it's just there. um, So they know they have community because I truly believe that, in this world, the reason there's such an issue with postpartum health is because it's not a lack of, you know, meds or care. I think it's a lack of community care. 
I just think it, it's a woman who just went through the most transformational thing she probably ever could. She's a totally different person now, learning how to raise this tiny human and all she needs is support. And I think that that is just so valuable. Um, and I think if we start shifting as a society to get back to that community-based care, I think we'll notice that the postpartum disorders um, start to slow down and aren't so intense because they don't feel so alone. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly in physical therapy uh, with pelvic health, health, they really mm -hmm. want every woman to go after birth and get physical therapy on the yes. pelvic floor muscles and really retrain all of that and get that back in order. Cause I know a lot of women as they get older complain of different types of incontinence. And a lot of that is due to the stress that you go under with birth. Absolutely. Yeah. Keone, anything else? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could talk all day, um, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but like some of these disorders, I've seen clients who had the, the depressions for some of them mm. is unreal that they're like, I, you know, the postpartum depression. What do you have any ideas about that, Kylie? Um, I think it all goes back to community care and that mom being supported in what she needs, whether it's therapy, whether it's an hour free from the kids or the baby. Um, I think there's just been such a stigma for so long around how moms are supposed to bounce back when in reality, I don't think that bouncing back is what we're made to do. I think we're made to shift and change. Right. Um, so I think that it comes to that point of recognizing she's a different person. You know, things have changed. In what way can you be supported going forward? Um, and she might not know. And that's what's hard is her body's regulating, you know, after a year of growing life and then birthing it. So her hormones, everything's fluctuating and still regulating. Um, so I definitely think that sometimes medicine prescriptions are absolutely necessary if there's a chemical imbalance. Um, and I think it just takes, you know, that community care, but that's where it is so hard because so moms feel so many moms, I think, feel like they can't reach out because they'll be seen as vulnerable or weak or yeah. unable to be a mom. Right. Unable to be a mom and, and do what they can. And there are a, a lot of women are expected to go right back to work. They, you know, right. they, they, don't have the time to spend with their child anymore mm -hmm. or whatever. Find yeah, they're missing that bonding that they're just biologically desiring. Yeah, yeah. And and a lot of different countries, um, especially European countries, give it seems gives a lot more time off to mothers than than we do here in the U.S. for yeah. for that whole postpartum process oh yeah and that's one other thing is like postpartum it's a joke to me that it's considered a six-week thing here in the U.S. when you know we spend nine years or nine years nine months growing <laughs> ten months pretty much at the end of the day growing a human so we're spending a whole year growing a human but you need to be back to normal in six weeks and that's where I think it, a lot of it is just not you know, like, let's sit, let's take a step back and think about that for a second. They just spent a year shifting and changing. It's going to take at least a year for them to, like, figure out who they are now in this body with this mindset. Right. So. Yeah, and I think if, if you had that support system, I don't know the studies, but I would think that in countries where you have more time like that, you're going to have less, less problems, you know, mm -hmm. with the postpartum stuff. Absolutely. Are yeah. you guys hearing that? I'm sorry. Are you hearing the, the beeping? You're not hearing anything, right? Not hearing the beeping. All right, great. Cause I'm, I'm, my <laughs> phone is like blowing up and I'm, or I think it is. But anyway, but yeah, so I think, I think you hit it right on the community involvement and societal involvement can help with a lot of the problems going on with that. Yes. Kylie, yeah. I want to ask you about also nursing. When I, I was born in 1970, and at the time, they were saying that formula is much better for, I mean, it, I, I, it's unreal that this was like. Kind oh, of it's unreal. I, I was just showing one of my doula clients um, a hospital tip sheet from like 1963 
yeah. and the recommendations on it are ridiculous. They said not to nur- They said for moms not to nurse their babies for more than five minutes at a time. Wow. Right. Well, some of them said don't nurse at all. I mean, yeah. it, that's, I was talking to my mother about it, and she was like, "Yeah, they just told us not to nurse." So I was like, "But where, where, where's that that information coming from?" You know? Yeah. Um, what, what is the common sense of that? You know, I understand, you know, formula is, is good if you, if, you know, possibly if you can't nurse, but there are other options out there besides formula. If you can't, if a woman can't actually nurse, right? Right. Yeah. And so the biggest thing I learned too, in my doula training, I had no idea was how sensitive the microbiome is of a baby's gut. Yeah. And that is one reason why breastfeeding is so mm-hmm. vital because that's what we we were learning about just the differences of babies you know when they're when they're formula fed instantly their gut doesn't recognize it where it recognizes breast milk right um so i think that alone is huge i definitely think formula is necessary if you can't produce if there's lack of supply obviously but i'm 100 percent for breastfeeding i've seen so many people be able to do it and do it exclusively but it's hard work and that's to another thing where i just think women need to be educated in that it's hard work you have to stay nourished as a mom you have to stay hydrated as a mom because you're literally feeding another human (laughs) right yeah do you have do you have any issue i I just hear again this is a lot of fear-based stuff i hear from the conventional community but do you have any issue with uh um, the La Leche League and the, the breast milk they can provide for a woman, like, is that a safe supply of breast milk or not? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, there's, there's a group here in Jacksonville for exclusively for breast, breast milk trading. Uh-huh. And, and I don't see any issue with it. If, I mean, if I were in a situation where I wanted my baby breastfed and I couldn't, I would, I uh, I would definitely, that would be my first route would be to see if I could get breast milk from anywhere else. Right. So, yeah. So, so that's, that's the thing. And that's where I, I kind of fall to. It'd be like, well, then let's at least get human breast milk. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and then if we can't maybe consider formula, but yeah. I, you know, you read stuff on the, the internet that's just like, well, you don't, you don't know if that stuff's being screened. You don't know where it's coming from, you know, all that stuff. And I, again, that's part of the, scary process that I guess right. men have to be educated on and know that, um, you know, the, the supply is safe and they do their homework on that, you know? Exactly. Yep. Well, that was, that was honestly my first thought when you were talking about Keone, but then just taking it a step back and thinking about what she said earlier, what it, you were only being recommended formula at one point and how far away that is from human breast milk. It, it yeah. just seems back ass words. Really it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It's crazy. And that's what, when I went home last to Cincinnati, both of my great, my great grandmother still alive. My grandmother is. So of course I was like, I need to hear your birth stories. They both were put to sleep. Holy hell. Yes. (laughs) They were put to sleep. My, one of my grandmothers has birthed 10 kids and she was put to sleep. Yeah. Like that just blew my mind. I just sat there and I was like, no way, no way. She was like, yeah, we, we, babies were in the nursery. We'd see them. And that, that was the other thing in that, um, that sheet I had seen the other day, it was saying like, babies are only on display from 9am to 10am. That's the only time you can see them. Like, oh man, how did we, I just, I, it just blows my mind that we thought that we had to live by those kind of rules. <laughs> what, are the, what do they do now? I, they, I mean, if the woman, basically you give birth, is the baby given right to the mother or is it yeah. taken away? Okay, it is now, right? Mm-hmm. Now it is, unless, unless um, cesarean sometimes, like for cesarean, maybe they'll take baby to nursery. Um, but usually babies put to chest <laughs> almost oh. immediately. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So, so it's like again that's a that's a that's a big choice right like you can mm-hmm. it sounds like it's standard of care now but it used not to be right. yeah i mean i would yeah i don't i don't think to my knowledge 
in, in at least for my experience, the hospitals I've been in, I have not seen nurseries with babies in them. Like the nursery I saw at the last hospital I was at, there was no baby in there. Okay. Because babies are with mom. So I think, I think like the whole nursery thing is definitely dwindling. Right. So uh, just your, your opinion, I guess kind of everything we talked about, but what it, it the United States, why are we so far, why are we so bad with the infant mortality compared to other industrialized countries? Aren't we pretty bad with that? Or is that just propaganda I'm reading? No, we're bad. But we why? are, we should, we should really be ashamed for how rich of a country we are, how horrible our healthcare is in terms of birth. And do you think that has a lot to do with every, like a lot of stuff we've already talked about, like having a doula? Yeah, make- I think- I think just because it's a business here in the United States. Yeah. Hmm. I think because they make money off of birth. And there is a good Netflix documentary called The Business of Being Born. Everyone should watch it. Um, And, yeah, I definitely think that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's crazy when I looked at some of those statistics. How how great, how bad, how bad it can be. But. Mm -hmm unreal um so as far as uh as far as being a a doula and being an advocate uh for a woman like it seems to me that the poor communities and stuff like that may not have access to a doula is that true i mean it seems like you know middle class upper income families have the means because i don't think our doulas can you are does insurance cover it or anything like some, that? Some insurances are starting to cover it, but okay. um, most will not. Um, and it is a it is a privilege. It's definitely a privilege. Um, my last two clients I worked with were free because they were both women I met through the Magnolia Project downtown mm-hmm. in Jacks. Um, and the Magnolia Project serves. Um, all over downtown Jacksonville, just offering different services. They, I was, I was introduced to them because they were taking a yoga class that Magnolia Project had offered, and my dear friend who worked there connected us. Um, so, with that being said, it's kind of where I love to be. Um, I'm finding that it's it's definitely the work I want to be doing. So we're hoping to continue growing um with magnolia project in hopes that we can get a doula program in there for all of the women that's that's my end goal and i mean end goal end goal would be honestly to be a doula in duval county jails Mm -hmm. wow i would think you'd have the biggest impact in in that community you know. Well, I mean, it's barbaric. The conditions they're birthing in in jail, it, it's barbaric. Wow. It, they don't have anyone. They don't, the pain meds are bare mm-hmm. minimum. Um, so it's it's definitely where we need more advocacy. Um, it's definitely where I think hopefully we will see it grow to, but it's hard because <laughs> we as a society have to respect the whole birthing process first before we start, you know, thinking that inmates should get to birth how they want. Right. 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 So. But you're optimistic. It sounds like that. Yeah, I like. am. I am. I'm very optimistic. I'm hopeful. I think I do. I think that when we change the way we view birth, we can change the world. So that's kind of, how I'm moving through my days right now. That's a, that's a great way. That's a great yeah. way to move through your day. Yeah, that's <laughs> optimistic. I, I agree with you. I'm optimistic about most things. I think the more we educate people, the better. I'm yeah, just, and that's why I'm just glad to talk about it, just because I talk about it with all my friends, my family, just so they know that we have these options. So here's an, here, I guess here's another question before we end, but um, so I'm, people – since we're doing this podcast, I'm sure there's going to be a number of people that are going to hear you. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you do distance doula? Doula, I guess is. I mean, I yeah. guess you. Can, I mean, right? people, 
yeah, people do it. Um, I'm happy to. There's there. I have friends. I am born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I do still have a good family friend connection up there. Um, and it's something I definitely would be willing to just be a virtual support if you have questions. If you if you're just calling like, hey, what about this? Um, it's definitely something I could do, and even up to the point of you know in the birth I can call I can be on FaceTime we can I can make it work (laughs) yeah Yeah. and I'd imagine you'd be a a good resource with your experience for you know referring to midwives or OBGYNs and people that you work with who are open to what you do you know right yeah no and I just that's what I love to educate clients just in their options so and that's what I'm happy even if someone just has a question about what ways they can birth I'm happy just to answer that yeah, thanks, awesome. thanks for being on. That was incredible. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to need Thank a doula you. for myself if my wife yeah. and I go to Yes. <laughs> I'll be calling you, Kylie. <laughs> okay. Via FaceTime, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sweating. <laughs> Kylie, help me. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm giving birth. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Kylie. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank have you. a good one. You too. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.